delighted to have you back for what happens to be our 221st episode of Think Tech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture. And we're broadcasting live uh, in this volume three of uh, Happenings for Reason with only the two of us, because our third one, a Bishop Museum historian and archivist DeSoto Brown is unfortunately down with allergies, so we'll get better DeSoto. Hope you're getting over it soon. So we will having uh, with us uh, our um, le leisure legacy legend, Ron Lindgren from Long Beach, California. Hi, Ron. Hello, hello everyone. Good to have you back. And myself, wouldn't you wish I would be back near Munich or I am on the Haltree Terrace on the Holokalani, which is our project we continue to talk about, Ron, right? Yes. So let's switch to the first slide. And uh, again, this is all in the content of us having gotten closer to October 1st, which was the reopening of the Halikalani. And uh, me uh, being a frequent um, um, runner on that shallow little um, beach walk there that we're going to talk to how much more shallow that gets uh, <laughs> pretty soon. Um, and a few days before the opening, um, I saw them, which made me very, very optimistic about, according to quoting again, uh, Daryl Hall uh, singing to John Oates, nothing has changed, man, that they were power washing uh, these uh, perforated screens here, Ron, and tell us a little bit more about them. You know, w when we realized that uh, the existing Orchids restaurant in the Lewis house really wasn't quite large enough uh, to handle uh, how, how busy we, we had all hoped the restaurant would be, and that became that case. But also on Sunday brunch, uh, the, the existing building just wasn't large enough. And so we thought of extending out into the lawns, which is a glorious feature to have right at the beachfront and the seawalk. And uh, we created some history there because I think anyone who looks at that steel light frame steel structure and the partly translucent canvas material that was stretched over it, or uh, actually rolls down from a uh, from a uh, an op open position to a closed position when the weather's bad, um, it it's obviously in addition to an older building. So there's there's some history to uh, to provide to. Uh, the historic uh, Lewis House. And we lucked out in that, in choosing that particular canvas fabric, which was treated with uh, some sort of material that helped to keep it, keep it, keep it look rather fresh and clean for a number of years, that it allowed just enough light in so that you were sitting in a glow while you had your seat uh, at the edge of the Lewis house uh, and right with this gorgeous lawn and its few precious palm trees uh, swaying away right next to your, your meal. Oh, absolutely. And with the show quotes up there on the very top left, it's very much like what's our PIing mobile and vehicle for thought in several ways for the show here in our uh, vintage, uh, also 80s from the same era, uh, Mercedes SL that has a convertible top. And that one you need to replace every so often. It's the same thing. And top right is the second uh, community grocery store we did, which is wrapped with a similar material um, that um, had the provocative uh, name brand Ferrari so that my very frugal clients were saying, oh, that must be really inexpensive. And uh, my son, Lenny, who used to live close to this grocery store at some point last year said, oh, it's, they took it away, it's all naked, but we were happy and relieved, equally relieved to see them uh, bringing it back. In your case, they didn't even uh, replace it at this point. They might at some point in the future, but it's, it's a little bit, the, the Lures Lounge is a masonry building. It's solid and stereotomic. But this addition is very airy and sort of temporary, right? And sort of more um, ethereal in its nature. So very good choice of material, Ron, just doing the, the right job for it. 
So let's go to the next slide. And uh, there is actually two restaurants um, uh, side by side. And this is getting us by the other restaurant that you tell us its name and its history, Ron. Yeah, we're, we're looking down at, uh, uh, through a sort of covered passage. Uh, by, by building code requirements, that passage, because it did have and still has a very handsome uh, jewelry store on one side, it, that, co that corridor was so long that we actually had to put glass doors at each end. Of course, management has just kept them open uh, and it, that's, that's, that's worked out fine. And you see the swimming pool off in the distance. When you make a hard right, you find yourself talking to a lovely lady and getting a, a seat at the house without a key. And the house without a key was based on a terrific uh, detective story. In fact, it was the very first Charlie Chan which was written by Earl Durr Biggers back in the 1930s when he stayed at the Halaklani. And uh, The House Without a Key, I'd recommend uh, everyone to get a copy. It's available in paperback. Uh, and it's still a very compelling, surprising, twisty uh, murder mystery in Hawaii starring Charlie Chan. Yeah. And quoting from your uh, previous shows, uh, showing and sharing the Halakalani with us, show quotes in the very top right is the very original condition from back in the days. And then to the left is the one from about two years ago, how you had created it. And now we're curious to see how after the remodeling it will look like. And that gets us to the next slide, because by now, it might be completed. We probably think it is, but this is a suggestive illustration, a rendering from the Alakalani's website that shows us how it's intended to be. And let's contemplate a little about that, Ron. The, uh, the, it looks, again, as if things haven't particularly changed, but I think there's a rather nice addition in the sense that there never was a sit-down bar out of the house without a key. And as one who often travels or often traveled uh, as a singleton on business mostly, but sometimes on, on pleasure trips to Hawaii, when I went, when I came to the Halakani to join in on the sunset festivities and the dancing and the music, uh, I sometimes had to just horn in on a four uh, seat table. That's an uncomfortable situation. There are those days when you don't want to sit with strangers and make new friends, uh, and you, or you've got things just to mull over, or if you're just feeling a little more antisocial. Uh, I think it's a fine addition on management's part to have a place to sit uh, uh, sort of back away from the action, because the, the real action is from the roofed area out to the ocean, where at sunset, Tables and chairs are inevitably, at least before the pandemic, filled solid with happy people ready to applause when the sun sets off to the west. Yeah. And there's one thing that sticks out, literally and figuratively speaking. Well, there's actually two things. But one thing is the bar you've been talking about. And we've, in a little eye-winking way, put the show quotes up there from our recent visiting um, Madeira. And uh, Oscar Niemeyer's swooping sexy curves. So while you, Ron, had uh, left the sexiness to the people uh, using your space, here the interior architects of the remodeling seem to wanting to do that to to that sort of sticking out bar there. And I, the frequent observer, while jogging by before they boarded it up uh, to continue to do work while they had reopened the hotel. I saw the structure going together and I have to say, you know, it is light gauge steel clad with something. So we will talk about um, sea water level rise in a little bit. So uh, when the water is coming in there, you know, they might just wash it away. And so, you know, it's not permanent. That's all we try to say, right? This is an interior element that is as easy to be replaced again in the future as it was to be put in there, right? So uh, let's go to the next slide because that's the pool area that's right next to it. 
And um, there is that little bit of a, uh, which seems a private Halikolani beach, but in fact, there is no such thing in Hawaii. Everything has to be public, but it's just that little alcove from that pretty narrow uh, boardwalk there on the beach that seems to be a naturally um, integral part to that sort of uh, landscaping of the Halikolani. And again, we talked about the pool run uh, before, uh, back then, show quote up there, we talked about that it has been just technically been updated. I should have been waiting for that sort of uh, pinkish uh, water uh, air mattress getting out of the pool uh, and have a s equally scenic thing as you told us back then that they put this little girl in the pool that made the pool look twice as large, right? Yes. So, um, so that's that's the water, and we we said there is a there is a hidden message or, or a blue thread through the shows about water happenings for a reason, and that gets us to the next slide, and see how uh, what the water is doing outside of your hotel, and this is actually uh, in the back there. This is the the most ever wing of your project. And next to it is, which we see in the, in the following picture, is the Outrigger Reef and the former shorebird. And here we see that seawater level rise is not a myth anymore. It's actually happening, right? Couldn't be more obvious. And DeSoto provided us this um, quote from the Star Advertiser. So now it's even out there in the media. This was a double page article in the Star Advertiser from some couple of days ago. Let's go to the next slide and look at how that looks like when you walk along your, well, this is shorebird again. And, um, you know, this, uh, the palm trees there uh, reminded us of, 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 of gum uh, retraction. Uh, I, I witnessed when they cut down one of these and in the article that DeSoto provided us, they're talking, it's eating up the foundation of the outrigger. They want to replace that part anyways, which we reported about in a show way back then. And also there's this little ironic historic um, um, uh, rumor, or I guess it's more than that. One of the tour guides in your Halikolani, uh, Ron, once told me about that sort of interesting uh, uh, neighbor, uh, I guess, uh, relationship that your clients had with Roy Kelly, who is the founder of the Outrigger Hotels, and that this particular part in front of his property had no beach to begin with. And then they were sitting at a table with Dillingham and Dillingham said, I might want to give you a beach. And he did. And uh, respectively, Kelly never paid him for that. So we were saying maybe this is a Dillingham's late revenge here of the beach being taken away again. But how is this impacting your project, Ron? And go to the next slide and you tell us about what you think. Yeah, the, the, when the hotel originally opened, and we're, and we're talking about 37 years ago, uh, one of the glories of the hotel is that, in some respects, that there isn't a beach right in front. And instead, in a very uh, almost more interesting way, there's a seawall that's been there for forever. Uh, and in the first few years, some very high winter uh, storm surges did just sort of just crash right over and right through uh, this walkway. And literally uh, ten, tens of thousands of people on a busy day walk on that seawall in front of the hotel. Um, it also provides wonderful uh, people watching for people in uh, the House Without a Key and the Orchids Restaurant within the Lewis House just to watch humanity passing forth in all its glorious forms up and down that seawall. But that amount of salt water that came in early on when the hotel uh, was first open was sort of unexpected on, on our part, certainly on my part. And it killed a lot of the, of the grass that uh, ha had grown right up to the seawall itself. The only separation between people uh, and the, the Holoclonic property, property originally were uh, some sort of low bushes that you could look over. Uh, in time, thank God, the bushes grew even higher because people would just walk right through the bushes. That's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's the, the nature of, of people mm -hmm. on, on holiday. They feel, uh, you know, yeah. it's Hawaii, it's their Hawaii. Now we've got 
you know, the, the real effects of climate change showing up. The slide uh, before shows how just how endangered and how endangered structurally that portion of the adjoining hotel is by the rising seawater and the winter storms that will drive water in and onto that property. Um, yeah, I remember the bushes that you were talking about, and I've only been in Hawaii for a decade, nearing a decade next year. And I remember when they put this uh, plywood, uh, you know, uh, thing up there. And and what's behind that? Let's diagnose that more and go to the next slide and see what that actually is. And it's actually bags of dirt that are covered with this black membrane. And uh, we can go to the next slide and remember what we saw on the previous slide. What they cover it up is something that we don't get particularly excited about, right? What is that? What's the final layer of the berm? Yeah, it's, it's actually an, uh, an artificial grass. Uh, and of course, uh, artificial grass can be made to look ex extremely real. You'd actually have to go down and, and chew on, on some of the blades of grass to realize sometimes that it isn't real. But it's, it's sort of obviously not real. And so now we have this berm rising up from the pool terrace and from the lawns that run between the house without a key and uh, the orchids restaurant. And it, there's some soil on uh, there. There's some bags, sand perhaps. Uh, then there's some fabric uh, material that uh, I suppose is meant to help protect and keep the bags of sand together. And then all topped by this unfortunate artificial grass, which is a little too green and a little too vivid to be real. I do not think that when the next really big storm comes in in the winter, all along the, the, the coast of Waikiki, that those, that kind of a berm will even stand up to the force of the waves, uh, given that the water levels are higher now uh, from 37 years ago. And even yeah. though that being higher is a matter of, of an inch or, or, or maybe two, that yeah. turns out, when you consider the whole worldwide situation, a huge increase in the danger in what can happen when winter storms pour water over that, that temporary barrier. And of course, it can't be a temporary barrier. That problem is with us now and with the Haleklani and all of their neighboring hotels forever. There's going to have to be some very clever engineering with aesthetics in mind to create something that first of all, won't separate the hotels from the ocean experience and being able to see the horizon. And uh, yeah, as I say, it, that, uh, and also it's showing the fact that the, the 130 year old how tree that fell is also lying there, <laughs> perhaps being a part of the barrier. Uh, <laughs> The, the, the grand old tree, which, which was a wonderful feature and always, uh, always in magazines and advertisements and travel posters and so forth. Uh, at, at that age, it finally gave up the ghost, but it isn't dead. It's, gro it's growing you know, new growth out of the tree. But somehow, I, I don't find it all that attractive as a vestige of what this glorious tree that used to spread out way over the house without a key terrace, and over the nighttime uh, stage where the music, uh, where the, uh, the musicians played, and where the Hawaiian dancer held court nightly. Um, Absolutely. Maybe yeah, it no. has to go as well when something. Like one can, yeah, maybe a positive twist would be, and I think that's the way they try to justify it. They said, you know, it got up to that age that it just needs to lay down all the time. But that's a little bit of an <laughs> ironic, right? So the two together really is, are kind of a sad uh, scenario there that needs to be worked on. Absolutely, Ron, I, I agree. So, but let's go back in and, and look at the hotel in a way that we actually have never looked at it before. And that gets us to the next slide. And I want to pull you out of your comfort zone, which, you know, is you, you like that. 
And this is uh, my, my provocative thing I'm going to throw at you is the term decadence. Uh, and that has to do, certainly, I allow myself to say, has to do with the era you were designing this project, which was the 80s. And the show quote number five shows the guy who was running America at that time, that was Ronald Reagan. And Ronald Reagan itself was the impersonation of that decadence of just, uh, you know, you know, doing it uh, no matter what, the more the better. We are America, we can do it. Let's not worry about anything. And it reflected in what you could see on TV and what me as a young Ger a German guy was, was, you know, how America was depicted starting at the top left with the TV series Dallas uh, from the late 70s until the uh, early 90s, actually. And this is J.R. Ewing, who had a Mercedes SL. And then to the right of it, which we see here, number two is Jonathan and Jennifer Hart as Hart and Hart, who had one or actually a couple that was from uh, 79 till 80, mid 80s when you were building it. And even more shocking at the very top right, this is a gift of my dear friend Stefan, our Tiki basement expert who gave me for my last year's birthday, this uh, book about our Mercedes SL. And the image uh, number three to the left of it, we might even like less because the book uh, cynically says um, even Donald, the young Donald Trump, who we hope uh, is not coming back in a couple of years, at least not in the position he was some years ago now. So, so this role uh, basically is, is, about, is about decadence, but the bottom ones uh, show us a different twist as a uh, uh, Alex Foley, alias Eddie Murphy, and the original Beverly Hills one in front of one. And then the two gentlemen at the very bottom left is Magnum P.I., alias Tom Selleck, and Rick Orwell Riot to the right of him. And they both share something with you, Ron, uh, because they, at least in the screenplay, and you in real, are Vietnam veterans. And they're certainly not the people of the same wealth and power of the one at the top and of the same decadence, but you guys give it a different twist. And let's look at that different twist because we've been talking about the interior, not just of the common areas, but of, of the core of the hotel and of hotels, which is the guest rooms. And now the first time ever on stage, thanks to you, Ron, next slide is the original interiors also of the hotel rooms, starting with the suites and tell us about. Yeah, I was going to say that uh, that this era was was the time when greed is good. We yeah. decided, and I decided, and my talented interior designers decided that decadence could be good, and and could actually be seen as a luxury if it isn't too over the top. And I think the the pictures that we're looking at these happen to be special suites that uh, were commissioned to Vera Wang, uh, uh, the fashion designer who, the, in fact, there's hardly anything that she hasn't got put her uh, design hands on now. Uh, interior design at the Halaklani was, uh, I think, a, a fine example of her taste of sort of a luxe but tropical look. And you're, you're looking at a master bedroom in a suite on the left. And at the right, you're looking at an adjacent dressing room, which is not afraid to be a bit decadent. And it certainly is luxurious. And I appreciated uh, their appearance very much when I saw them in place for the first time. Although I never quite had the cash to stay overnight in a Holly Clowney suite at $4,000 a night. Yeah, we came up with two uh, also good terms. They were glamour and glitter, right? These are terms that fit well in, in what we're seeing versus maybe gaudy. And these days we would say gaudy and the, the 80s were very gaudy, but, but glitter and glamorous really, you know, um, describes it pretty well. And let's go to the next slide and see how the bathrooms have been um, accentuated. And you told me that at the very bottom left in, in, this, um, in the sink area, um, there is Leslie Wheelbeck, right? With these wonderful uh, lighting fixtures left and right of the mirror. Yes, the, the, the interior designer 
was really interested in glamour. Uh, and, and again, if, if it's held in some check, that, that that glamour would read through and it would be a part of the hotel's identity as a luxury resort hotel. And so we see mirrors and glitter and sparkle. And for women uh, to work on their makeup before hitting out for an evening uh, elsewhere in uh, Waikiki, this was an ideal uh, situation. Uh, next to it, Vera Wang uh, kept a little bit more moody in terms of her color schemes, but she was creating a, uh, a large bathroom, large enough for four, frankly. I'm not sure why four would be in the tub at the same time. But as you're there, you're looking out through the open, open uh, lanai doors and you can see nighttime Waikiki and the wonderful glitter of, of the city beyond and the looming darkness and the mass that you, that you can experience of Diamond Head Crater. Yeah, and let's get to the next and last slide for today, which shows us once again uh, the more uh, normal, so not the suites, but the normal guest rooms, but they're anything but normal, but they're very tropical, exotic, and not as heavy, right, and oversaturated as the ones that we are afraid are the current ones. Right, Ron? The original interior design uh, was done by uh, an architect from Seattle who has done a lot of interior work, but he's also designed many fine buildings in the Pacific Northwest. The picture on the lower right shows uh, Diamond Head sort of fitting in with what the, the, the room appears to be, the character of the room. The furniture is, is very light. The pieces uh, don't really match each other. It's like uh, maybe the room has grown and you've, they've taken some furniture out and replaced it with others. Very light residential scale. And notice the touches of live orchids and uh, they brought in the tropics. I mean, they were lucky to have the, uh, the famous crater off in the distance, but even those rooms that didn't have a crater had the tropicality within the room uh, and we'll be looking at what, what at least I think, and perhaps uh, Martin and DeSoto and I have found, that the new, new renovated rooms uh, have, have lost that character for reasons we're not sure. To the lower uh, right is another Vera Wang. Uh, it is actually a part of the suite, but the one reason we wanted to show it was uh, when we will be looking next week at the typical newly renovated room, in, in contrast, what uh, Vera Wang did was she used furniture that is overtly, uh, has overt Asian touches, as you can see, and that there are strong color contrasts. And there's a large living plant shown on the right, which relates to the happy uh, situation of having a living palm tree frond swaying back and forth uh, out over the lanai. We'll be seeing, uh, we'll be seeing a different sort of room that's been proposed, not proposed, but built and paid for next week. And we have our questions about that. Exactly. And with that, stay tuned for that. We're at the end of another exciting show. And until next week, where we start exactly there, Ron, stay as gloriously glittery and glamorous as you, Ron. Bye-bye, guys. <laughs>